enthusiasm. Uh, while pleasing the viewers at home or those of you in the future who will be seeing this. Thank you. Uh, the talk that I had listed was the pain of network, intru network intrusion detection and prevention. In the description, you saw a line that said traditional IDS should be dead. I thought that was just more interesting, so that's what the name of this talk is. It's still going to cover the same things. I would hope, well, let me just say briefly, this talk was born out of some recent incident response work that I've done where I just became exceptionally frustrated with the stuff I had to deal with. Basically, other people's gear, stuff that I wasn't, stuff that I had not set up, but I was forced to use other people's stuff. And so part of the presentation was just to find out if you're not doing things this way, and I'm not trying to say that my way or the highway, although lots of people accuse me of that, if you're not doing things the way I present them, I really want to know how do you stay sane? Um, you could see I went through my crazy period where I couldn't take it anymore and I tore all my hair out and here I am. Um, I want to find out, those of you who have not yet reached this stage, how do you keep your head of hair? Because if you're using the same type of products that I had to deal with on some of these recent cases, I just don't know how it's possible. I don't know how you can find things. I don't know how once you find things you can investigate them. And I don't know once you find things and investigate them whether or not you can tell there was really a problem. Please feel free then to throw your schmoo balls, get my attention, talk to me. I have a torn right rotator cuff, which means I cannot throw back unless I want to pretend I can throw back with my left arm, and then I'll look like I'm throwing like my two-year-old uh, daughter, which I don't, I don't recommend having stored on videotape. So if you'd like to get in touch with me, there's my email, web, blog, etc. For those of you who don't know who I am, um, I've written some books about detection and monitoring and forensics and all that sort of stuff. All right. This is my arguments. This is my thesis. This is sort of, in a nutshell, what we're going to talk about today. The first thing I'm going to talk about is that I constantly do consulting and such, and I find that many people are still living in 1997. So I wanted to lead with a little look at what was it like in 1997, and what is it like now, 10 years later. I'd like to next talk about how prevention always fails, and yet most people just focus on prevention to no end. And they just make detection sort of this thing you don't even really worry about, because our stuff is so good. The third thing is people use the term intrusion detection, but to me, it's an investigative process. And when you're doing prevention, intrusion prevention, you don't need to investigate. And I'll say some more about that. I will pause it. And again, this is the bring it on track. So I'm going to bring it. And we'll see anyone who wants to debate me on this. It'll be cool. Um, most people that I see doing intrusion detection, I think they're just m managing alerts. It's like they're just pushing blocks around. Hmm, yes, this is, this is what I'm doing. Pay me my bill, you know, pay me my salary, pay me my MSSP, I'm doing my 50 SLA and so forth. You're not actually investigating anything. And I'll try to provide, what, I, what I'm going to do is give you seven examples. Um, seven examples where I don't know how you, well, the first example is a gimme. This is how you could resolve this incident using traditional methods. The next six, I'm going to say, I don't know how you could possibly resolve these without collecting the sorts of data that I'm going to advocate. And by the way, none of this is secret sauce. None of this stuff is anything that you could not leave this room and do immediately using open source tools, or perhaps with your own tools if you're so inclined. I'm going to talk about the differences, differences between investigating facts and inferences. And I'll try to leave you with a hook that if you're not collecting the right kinds of traffic, then you're probably going to be hurting. i also like to address a couple things that came up in the uh, web application IR talk that Mike and uh, Joel and Matt just gave. So if we think back to 1997, we had Goodwill Hunting. And now in 2007, we have Rush Hour 3. Thank God for the Rush Hour franchise, or Jackie would be in serious trouble, right? Uh, he had a real great run there in the mid-90s. If you've ever, has anyone ever seen his, his like movies from the 70s? Oh yeah, he's, he's climbing up walls. All the stuff that people do now with wires and CGI and Spider-Man, all that kind of stuff. Jackie Chan was literally running up walls in the 70s and then falling from the top of the wall, dusting himself off, getting back up. Just amazing. Okay, well that was, that was 1977. I'm talking 97 to 2007. Let's think for briefly, what's the differences between then and now? Back then, 10 years ago, there were intruders who were more or less breaking services that you probably didn't need to have open. Things like Sonar PC on certain, some certain service, it was available, somebody would break it. What was the patch? Turn that off. Or perhaps if it was a vulnerable service, you could apply a patch. You think back to the SANS top 10 back then, it was all, do these top 10 things and you will be much better off. There is no equivalent today with the SANS top 20. 
top 20 is completely, completely different. It's this huge list of all these CVEs for all these different applications. And even if you covered all of those, forget it, right? Well, I'll tell you why in a second. 1997, the majority of the malicious traffic that we saw, by the way, this is when I was watching the Air Force, so this is sort of my, my time frame. You could pretty much guess that if you saw somebody coming from Russia, it was a Russian and it was a person. It was not their bot, it was not a worm, whatever. Nowadays, automated, right? It's exceptionally difficult to even think about finding a single person who's actually doing something. I mean, back then, you could see people doing manual SQL injection, like this is not working. I have the back tick in the wrong place, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, these days, it's all automated. Back then, the, the goal was to take over a system. And you think about some of the, the categories that people used. You know, a category one incident in DOD was a root level intrusion. A category two was a user level intrusion, and so forth. These are so antiquated. Today, I don't need to take over a box to accomplish an objective. I might just totally, like they talked about in the web app class just now, I can just empty your database of what I need and who cares if I never take over the box? I have all the data that I wanted. That was really the, the whole point. Back then, to, def to defend yourself, you turned off services and you applied patches. These days, your people are running so many custom applications, there are no patches for what we're running. Everything is custom in many degrees. Um, and everything, as far as defense goes, emphasizes uh, secure coding and secure application development. And then finally, 10 years ago, in 1997, it was one year after the first public uh, DOS attacks against panics, right? In 1996, that's when it started. That's when uh, Mike Schiffman published his, his, uh, his article in FRAC about how to do a sin flood and all that. Back then, buffer overflows were real big. I think 1996, again, when uh, Smashing the staff Stack came out. And misconfiguration were the big issues. 10 years later, those are still some problems. But nowadays, we're dealing with all the web app stuff that's going on out there. Uh, rootkit, you know, rootkits went mainstream for Windows, kernel mode rootkits within the last two to three years. There were kernel mode rootkits for Solaris and stuff 10 years ago, but now it's, it's for Windows for the most part. And it's all about exploiting cu uh, customer data. Now, how many of you have managers that are still living in 1990? Yeah, I counter lots of management. They still think in terms of, Buffer overflow, they still, th well, they probably don't even really understand buffer overflow, but they still think in terms of that. They think in terms of a lot of the things that are on the left hand side of the page when the right hand side of the page is what we have to be worrying about. Now, the risk environment that we face is changing so much faster than the prevention environment. Um, if, you, if you need to find some funny photos, go to gratuitously long domain name.net. Find all these pictures, and I bet one day she's going to be at my conference. This is not me, that ninja lady. Uh, that's some, some lady who dressed up in ninja costumes in her bedroom and took a picture of her with her size, with her, um, her nunchucks, with her straight sword. So I use her for all my pictures of the threat because I just find it to be hilarious. But so the, those are your threats, right? I find that threats, when I talk about threats, I'm not talking about a hole in SSH. A hole in SSH is a vulnerability. A threat is a person who's going to attack you, right? Balls, come on. I, I'm caught, if you've, how many people read my blog, by the way? Wow, and the rest of you just came on blind faith? I, ap I applaud you mightily. Um, a, a constant theme of my blog is the differences between threats and vulnerabilities. And a threat to me is a person who can harm you, generally a person. Um, you know, a mal malware instantiated by a person is a threat insofar as it's executing the will of that person. Um, but vulnerabilities is something different. So you get all these threats out there. They're exceptionally creative, determined, and so forth. My opinion is that the only way we're ever going to solve this whole security problem is not by focusing on these things over here, like boxes that we have to defend. We have to go after these people. These should be laser beams on foreheads, like that, right? That is the only, taking out threats is the only way we're going to deal with this problem. The problem is we do not have the authority to do that. Uh, well, some of you in the audience may have the authority. You're a dot .gov or a dot .police, whatever you want to call it. That, you know, put me in, coach. I'm ready to help you. Let's, let's work on that end of it. Working on this kind of stuff, we're losing. Okay, so we have, we have defenses. Defenses, til, still to this day, are focused more on what's coming into the enterprise. We have just so, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to blind somebody over there. I'm sorry, I'll try to keep my beam this way. Um, we, have, we have assets that are just multiplying like crazy. You know, we've got this whole uh, consumer-driven bringing, 
different products into the enterprise now that we're supposed to manage, and we're just losing that battle as well. And then finally, assets are everywhere. So we, very difficult situation. All right. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about when you need to investigate and when you don't need to investigate. I'm not a big fan of IPS. I think that an IPS is just a layer 7 firewall, and while that's helpful, you didn't need to define a whole new market category for it, right? Here's the real story of uh, IPS. Is anybody here from Tipping Point? Okay. Either you've, you've been to my talks before and you say, oh, you're from Tipping Point? Oh, that's even better. The comment was uh, he believes he heard that Tipping Point paid Gartner to do the... Oh, wow, okay. We'll just say Tipping Point. We'll invent history right now, and it's on videotape. No, okay. Anyway, um, so in 2001, I got a call from this company in Austin when I was just about to leave the Air Force, and they said, we're inventing this new thing called an intrusion prevention system, and it's going to stop attacks and blah, blah, blah. And I said, that sounds like a firewall to me. No, no, it's different. It's fast. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> I said, oh, okay. And, of course, I didn't do that. I went elsewhere, and, you know, look at all those stock options I could have had, I suppose. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about the difference about when you need to investigate and when you don't need to investigate. If you have any access to the network and it stops something, do you need to care about it? No, it stopped it. It doesn't matter if it was legitimate, illegitimate, whatever. There is no investigation because nothing happened. The that state on the endpoint of the system that was the target has not changed because the traffic that was involved could not reach it. Now, if you're interested in finding out more about that, that potential attack that was denied, yeah, okay, you might want to do some, some level of investigation, but in terms of verifying that the state of the target has changed, who cares? The state has not changed. Every other situation, however, requires intervention in the form of investigation. For example, you have a prevention system, but it doesn't recognize that it's an attack. It sails through, state on the target has changed, now you need to investigate. You have a, now, so that's the active side. On the passive side, traditional IDS, you always need to investigate. Always. Because the IDS isn't doing anything. It's passive, right? It's letting, so the state of the target may or may not change. The question is you have to find out if that happened. Now, this is the key point. Do, do I have, ah, see, do I have any IDS vendors? No, all hands are down. I'll see if I recognize any of you as IDS vendors. I know a couple of you are here. I don't see you here. There must be in the other talk. Wise. Um, they'll beat me up later. <laughs> the, the, uh, the IDS vendors, some of them recognize that this is necessary. In other words, they need data to investigate, but they think that it's too expensive. In other words, they want to stay under a certain cost per box. And if they were to ship you, you know, full up network forensic appliance, which is basically what you need to do this properly, they would, you know, they would pretty much price themselves out of the market. The thing is, though, the world is waking up that the way we've been doing things for the last 10 years is not working. And the only thing that will help is having more data. That's sort of a preview, but let's, let's keep going. So, whoa, one new voicemail. Hopefully it's not sent from someone in Shmukon who has decided how to access Anyway, so intrusion detection systems, I would submit to you, are at best an incident indication system, and it's providing an inference, right? I, I challenge all of you, and this isn't a challenge, just go ahead and do it. You won't get hacked or anything. Go to www.testmyids.com and see what happens. I'll give you a little preview. You'll get this um, UID zero root, group ID zero root, and so forth. It's a nice little way to test whether you watching um, certain signature-based activity with Snort, right? It's the easiest thing to come up with because I don't, know, I don't know how many of you ever hung out in IRC channels with all the Snort newbies and they're always saying, I, I'm port scanning the crap out of my Snort box and I can't see anything. So I just say, go to testmyids.com. If it gives you an alert, you're good, right? What, if you have an IDS monitoring traffic and it sees this pattern of activity, and I've already lost my pointer, there it is. It sees this pattern of activity the IDS is going to say, I think I saw traffic that someone told me to report as the result of running the Unix ID command, typically after gaining a shell on a, on a system, right? Now, you can replace that idea with just thousands and thousands of examples. In fact, anyone know what the latest snort rule set count is up to? They recently went over 10,000, right? And how many of those rules are st still around since 1998? number, 
right? Because more is better. Now, and it's not really Snort's fault, I would, I would argue, but because, you know, we have full control. You could, you could turn off whatever rules you like. But they, again, they're trying to compete in this marketplace, and it'd be easy for somebody else to say, oh, no, more is better, and so forth. All right. Key concept, inferences versus facts. What I just showed you was an inference. An inference saying, when I see this, I believe that the following has happened. Someone has rooted your box, they sent a shell back somewhere, contained the results of the ID command. That's an inference. A fact, on the other hand, is this. The fact is, there's the content of a web page that contained those characters. The IDS saw it, and because it was programmed to watch within that, you know, within certain parameters, basically given by a rule that was on the previous page, it provided an inference. So the question is, are you dealing with inferences or are you dealing with facts? You know, it is a fact if your system reports I a connection from, from your protected system to Russia. Right? If there's a packet that comes from your box and it goes to Russia and you get you alert on that, there is that's a fact. It's not necessarily a fact that that box is rooted. Right? We'll go through some examples of that. So I, I would challenge you, whenever you look at these things, think about, am I looking at facts or am I looking at inferences? Because what you'll find is that more often than not, the vendors are all providing inferences. And when the vendors provide inferences, you need to decide whether you trust it or not. How do you decide whether you trust it or not? You need some data to look at. Now, NFR, anyone use NFR? And I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm actually truly interested. NFR does something interested, interesting where, from what I understand, they have a probability rating, right? They, they'll say whether or not this alert has, you know, 90% of the time we find that it's good, maybe 50% of the time it's good, or whatever. That is a certain level of intellectual honesty that no other vendor has decided to, to <laughs> adopt, right? Because why would you say, oh, just that alert, that alert's only good 10% of the time? Why do you even bother, you know, bother me with that, right? All right. Who's that, by the way? Elvis. That is Elvis. Elvis is the patron saint of all security investigators. It's a hugely long story from years ago, but you will always see me using Elvis to depict the security investigator. By the way, what style of, of martial art is Elvis accomplished in? Kempo karate. Oh, you're all, you guys are great. I actually won a local contest, um, stump Elvis expert on the Don and Mike show, and I called in and I said, what style of karate did, Empo, did, uh, did uh, Elvis study? And the guy's like, oh, I don't know. And so I was like, Kempo karate, give me my free concert tickets, or whatever it was. <laughs> so. What I'd like you to do is, is we're going to walk through the investigative methodology for someone who is basically doing alert management. If you find that this is your situation, you are on the road to frustration, and you will end up looking like me. And that's a judgment you can decide whether or not you want to end that. Way. So you start out with a dashboard. Oh, by the way, this is what I also think. This is ticket management, and you'll end up in a straitjacket. OK, so you start out, and you have a dashboard. And the dashboard shows you an alert. And the analyst looks at the alert. The alert will not tell you, and I haven't found anything that really will tell you this, whether or not the attack succeeded. So the question then becomes, well, how do I tell if this thing succeeded? Hmm, I know, I'll look for more alerts. Because maybe there's some kind of correlation I can do, either, either automatically or manually. Look for more alerts, and if there aren't any more, well, you're, you're certainly dead in the water. Right then you're dead. If there are other alerts, and I'll give you an example of this in a moment, well, maybe you can make an inference as to what that first alert meant, and you can decide whether or not you care. If there are no other alerts, though, you're back at step one with the next alert that comes down the pike. Depending on the system that was hit, you may decide you need to do some kind of investigation, as in tear the box apart. I was, I was uh, consulting at one site uh, about a year ago, and I did some work the first day. The second day, all the guys I was working with, they come in, they're just all bleary-eyed, and they're just a mess. And I said, what happened to you guys? And they said, well, overnight, we got an alert on a very, very sensitive system. And I said, well, what, well, what did you do? And they said, well, all we had was the alert. And it said there was a, it was like either a shell code alert or something kind of lame, but there was no detail. It was an alert from a Cisco something, and <laughs> they, uh, they, that's all they had was the alert. But the system was sensitive. They needed to find out if it mattered. And because they had no other data, because I had just gotten on site, they, didn't, they hadn't implemented any of my stuff yet, they didn't have any other data, they had to do a thorough host space forensic analysis of this box. Time, money, wasted sleep, all of that. You don't want to be in that situation. The, it was nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It was probably a passive FTP connection, which causes most of the problems with anything these days. Anyone who does purely 
based analysis, if you're not accounting for passive FTP, you're probably getting huge skewed numbers, along with peer-to-peer. -peer. That's the other one that'll screw everything up. Okay, I'd like to present this as an alternative. This is what I call a security investigation, and this is not alert management. So Elvis, Elvis gets his original alert. He looks in his database for any more alerts. Eh, maybe he's, he's stuck with the same alert that he first got. However, what he has now is he has other forms of data that he can investigate. He's not stuck with the single alert that was given to either the same vendor product, and I have to say there aren't any vendor products I know of that give all of this. There's a couple that come close. I'm getting some demos. We'll see. And by the way, I think there will, this will be commercialized in the next two years. I've been, I've been banging this hammer now for five years. I think seven years will be the magic number when enough vendors decide this is something that their customers need. So we'll see. It won't be me, by the way. I don't sell boxes. So the alert comes back. You say, hmm, I wonder if there's anything else that involves this source or destination of interest that I can investigate. And you can look at something called session data, meaning you know flows, conversations, whatever you want to call it. Something that was collected independent of the alert. It's just always being collected. You can take a look at it and make a decision based on that's a fact. You know That session occurred. Let's take a look at it. So you look at that and you say, hey, I think I see some outbound FTP sessions to a box owned by Heidi. And you say, Heidi is suspicious. She is a known intruder. This looks very suspicious, right? So you take a look at that session data. The next thing you do is you say, if you're also collecting the content of those sessions, you can rebuild them. Now, many times people say, Bait, like you're crazy. You can't do this in production. I do this all the time, right? It's just a question of scalability. You may not be able to do this everywhere. I don't recommend you do this in the core of your network. I don't recommend you do this on the 8 gigabit per second connection to Sony, like they asked me about recently and said, can you do this on our, on our Sony gaming network? And I said, you know, whoa. A different, more different model, eight gigs versus whatever. Um, but you could probably collect the sessions. That's a whole other issue. But I have done cases where I have, I have intercepted, well, not intercepted, just passively watched people's FTP sessions. You rebuild their tools, so you don't even have to do a host based investigation. You have a pristine copy of the host based tool. I was doing work like this at a university one year, and does anybody know anything about sort of like above the bottom feeder level of? like the pirate scene, they all use FTP, right? You, the, the, the tier one guys don't transfer stuff over Kazaa or whatever. They all use FTP to transfer their stuff. Well, there was a university I was monitoring who was involved as a tier one peer-to-peer -peer site. So they were transferring all these movies back and forth over FTP. Well, guess what I was doing? I was collecting all these movies and then reconstructing them. And I saw you know, Rush Hour 2 and it, before it hit the theaters because it, it was being transferred and I was able to grab all the packets. It's a great validate whether or not your system is working, and that's exactly why I did it. Okay. <laughs> I can guarantee perfect capture because I have these movies. And then we shut it down after three weeks. Okay. So you've got your full content, you reconstruct it, now you have what was transferred, and of course everyone is thinking encryption, all that. You know what? If they don't, if people aren't watching, how many intruders do you think actually go to the bother of encrypting stuff? It's increasing now. We're seeing HTTPS backdoors. We're seeing um, encrypted IRC, things like that. But a lot of people are just going clear text for everything. So you get that full content, and then you could say, hey, I wonder if there are any other sessions of interest. Basically, you're doing an investigation. You're not managing alerts. You're not moving around puzzle pieces. And in the end, the analyst is enlightened. And you end up like Buddha. But even that Buddha's got hair. I don't get it. All right, never mind. <laughs> so what I'd like to do now, I'm at the 28th. So this is working really well. Um, I would like to represent some ca or discuss some cases where alerts came up. I had to investigate them. And I want to find out if anyone cares to answer this. Th that would be cool. I'd like to find out how would you have dealt with this if you didn't have this data? Because I don't know how else to do it, honestly. A lot of this is based on frustration I've had at real cases where I'm, I'm brought in. And here's the problem, right? A lot of people think, hey, you know, I'm, I'm doing my, my work. I can't figure this let me go hire a security consultant because they must be smarter than I am and they'll, I'll bring them in and they'll figure stuff out. Honestly, you're not that much smarter as a security consultant, right? Um, what I find is that it's not, the, it's not the experience necessarily or whatever that makes the investigation, it's the data, right? You have good data to investigate, you could almost take a trained monkey and have the monkey find things, right? Not, almost, not quite, but you almost could. If you have no data and you're simply 
alerts. Albert Einstein couldn't figure it out. He'd be like, us, that is sin flawed. You know, he wouldn't, he had no idea, right? So you have to have good data. All right, first example. This is the bone I'm going to throw to all the people who think alerts are enough. Because in this case, I would argue alerts are enough. So hopefully you can read these. If not, I'm just going to describe them, and then I'll make them available elsewhere on my website or whatever. So you get an alert, and this alert is a, by the way, all of this is collected with Squeal, Squeal source front end to snort. Anything you want to know about that, just hit me up later. I'll, I'll totally fill you in on it. Um, by the way, the alerts are not represented as text. I did text dumps to render them on the screen, so I wouldn't have to go screenshot crazy. You get an alert. This is a snort alert. Uh, it's one of the bleeding edge alerts, which I actually tend to, how many people use the bleeding edge rules, by the way? Yeah, the number is going up. They used to be really kind of crapola as far as alerts went. You know, things like TSSCI data intercept because it saw the word secret or something. And I said, oh my god, or, or terrorist alert because it saw the word bomb in New York. I thought, these are the lamest rules. But since then, I mean, some of those are still around, but you just disable those. Since then, I've gotten a lot of good detects off of some of these bleeding rules. Anyway. So you get this bleeding rule, and it says, hey, I see UDP proxy inbound connect request from a Linux source. All right, so you look at that, and you say, well, let me use my met investigative methodology. Let me query for other alerts. And when you query for those other alerts, you see a bunch of peer-to-peer uh, -peer alerts. So apparently, someone's running what? BitTorrent. So if you think that all these other activities are associated with BitTorrent, and you get an alert that involves the same ports that are also being used for BitTorrent, what do you think this alert is really reflecting? BitTorrent. Yeah, so do you have to worry about it being this other UDP proxy inbound connect request? To the extent it's something malicious. Now, assuming you don't care about BitTorrent network. If, it, if you do care about BitTorrent, you would have been investigating the BitTorrent alerts as well. I would argue, in this case, alerts are enough. I didn't have to do anything else. I see that there's something associated with BitTorrent. If you decide that that's a problem, you investigate further, or you, you, know, you go after the person, whatever. There is, you know, as far as whether or not this is a compromise, no, right? You don't have to, you can make that assumption pretty safe. Unless you have Mr. Uber Elite Hacker, who has set up his, his BitTorrent as the screen, and then he's throwing things in at the same time. Nah, but don't worry about that. So that's the first example, easy. Second example, this is one where I would argue alerts are not enough. So you get an alert, and it says, this is a bleeding edge virus alert, and it's actually pretty decent. It's looking for what seems to be pretty popular these days, outbound web traffic to a bot herder's website, uh, hitting a PHP script with or without arguments afterwards, and then um, that instructs the compromised system to take a certain action. So you can see in this case the URL uh, it's ac accessing get z.php, just as the, this is the alert, um, the rule up here said to look for. And then it has some information afterwards. And you can see the URL goes to www.jigzone.com. I don't have no idea what jigzone.com is, so I said, hmm, that sounds kind of weird. But if this is, oh, and I guess I can forward, right? So there's the rest of the uh, information that was sent from the browser. What are you supposed to do now if this is all you have? OK, we had a comment, go to the website. From somewhere other than the company. OK, there is a certain building nearby where this is a standard method, uh, standard investigative practice, which I very much, dis you know, unless you're coming from a covered research network, and by covered I mean not associated with the organization, I do not recommend this as a primary investigative method. Because unless you, well, let me put it this way. If you're any good and you're the guy who owns jigzone.com, and let's assume that that's a hacker, you know, not a hacker site, espionage site, whatever the case may be, and you see someone investigating you, what does that person now know about the target? Yeah, what well, knows the target is aware. The only defense you have as a, as a defender is to play stupid, right? If you play dumb, there's a chance that the intruder will not be as as what uh, would otherwise be the case. And then you can sneak up on them and bang them over the head and kick them out of the network. But if you immediately reveal your hand like, hey, I saw you and I'm investigating you, all bets are off. The guy's going to either disappear, come back later, he's going to go encrypted, whatever the case is. So what I would recommend is let's have some data. Let's find out what's actually going on here. So let's do that. Well, if you're collecting traffic as this is happening, you don't have to duplicate anything. You can see exactly what 
its response was. So the blue is what was in the previous alert that triggered the activity. The red is the response. Now the red here is actually kind of interesting. It, makes it, it further worries me. Notice that this page is gzip encoded. This is a beautiful way to get around detection systems, right? Gzip encoding, there are no on the fly, as far as I know, there are no on the uh, Which one does? Okay. Right. Okay, so the comment was there, there are some technologies that will not permit gzip encoding. It'll force it into text-based. Okay, uh, but that's different from passively decoding the gzip. But yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Okay, so in this case, we have this, this request to that z, uh, z.php, that get request, and then we have a gzip response, which as far as I'm concerned, I'm, that doesn't make me feel any better because we know two things now. One, there's something listening, and two, it replied with something that I have to now decode if I want to see what it is. The next thing I would do in this sort of investigation is I will say, give me all the sessions that are, that are available. So I look at the sessions, and boom, it's just a whole bunch of web traffic. Again, this is not something that I feel really good about. Well, in this case, I decided to take that gentleman's suggestion, and I decided, you know what, let's just find what jigzone.com is, because so far, I don't feel really good about this. I could say, in all, in all reality, what I really did was I started going backwards to say, how did this guy end up at this site? And I found out that he had gotten an email with that as a link, and it was Valentine's Day. And as it turns out, jigzone.com is a JavaScript-enabled puzzle site, and the URLs they use look just like that bagel, whatever it was, Trojan thing. So z.php equals with stuff after it. There you go. That's, it's just jigsaw, jigsaw puzzles. All right. Case three. This one I really like because this is stuff that you'll see all the time, right? This is another internal to external. So it's an inside resource doing something outbound. This is a looking for the order jack Trojan. And when it sees a bunch of things like a call to options that CGI with a version ID and a passphrase and so forth. When something like this happens, you can make a pretty good assumption that that box has a problem. If you know the box has a problem, what's the next question you want to you find out? OK, well, who else has the problem? But how about, well, did, this, did anything happen, right? Is this site still? you know, serving up these, these potentially malicious res replies? That's the thing that I want to know. Well, you're not going to get that with these products, right? So what you have to do is have a source of data. If you're collecting that data, you find, in this case at least, there's the get request in the blue. And the web server that used to be, now I'll, I'll go with down one path and then I'll take you to the second one. This web server that used to be hosting this CGI apparently is no longer offering it. So you could say, apparently, this site, which was previously some sort of malware site, has now been disabled. The conspiracy theory aspect would be to say, no, this is just a really smart way to I'll, you know, come back in, in 24 hours when I'm not watching, perhaps. I don't know. But I would, I would tend to go more towards the non-conspiracy theorist uh, aspect to, of it. The point is, you can figure this out if you didn't have this data, right? Oh, is that? Ex OK, example four. All right. Next example. I see these all the time. The, this is off of the FTP preprocessor. So this is not signature based. This is protocol analysis based with Snort. The FTP preprocessor -pre is parsing all the stuff it sees via FTP and tells you when it sees things it doesn't like. So there's no signature here. It's, it's a protocol anomaly detection. So everyone who thinks Snort is simply like doing network grep hasn't been that way for years, right? There's FTP, Telnet, SMTP, DC, RPC. There's a ton of preprocessors that are doing advanced things and not just looking for a string of characters. So this FTP command channel encrypted alert comes up. And in the packet, you see there's this, there's this VS, EVSF sysutil uh, receive peak no. Now, if you Google for that, you'll find out that there's a problem with VSFTPD where it returns that sometimes. But there's really no, in terms of impacting the user, there's no issue. What I would like to know is, is this part of something that I should be worried about? And again, the only way to figure that out is to have data. And as you can see, you've got a retrieval of a, a, a um, barnyard squeal FreeBSD package. You see a call to passive mode. You see the file is sent. And then at the very end of it, you see there's that error. So 
No problem here. But without this data, you wouldn't know. Example five, TCP options. Has anyone followed the TCP options thing in the SANS ISC recently? OK. Are you a SANS ISC handler? No. OK. Oh, you're with Shadow Server. You're not the guy who sent me the traffic, are you? Oh, you did. OK, good. You're a hero. We'll talk about you in a second. OK, so, um, <laughs> so uh, there's this issue with SANS that I'll bring up in a second. This is sort of a preview of it. So there's been some alerts recently truncated TCP options. Now, this alert comes up, and again, this is a snort decoder saying, hey, I'm, I'm reading a packet. There's something weird with these TCP options. I'm going to tell you about it. You'll notice that sandwiched between these different alerts, there's, this, there's the bleeding edge scan, more BitTorrent, and so forth. So in this case, you can assume that um, you probably don't have to worry about this alert. But what if you did want to investigate it? Well, you had the packet that caused this, but the packet isn't really all that interesting. So what I like to do is, OK, let's expand this. Look at the sessions. Are there any sessions that look, that look suspicious? The one with the arrow is the one of interest, right? If you really, really, really care, then you have to go and grab the full content. As you can see, if you um, match up the packets the, with the right one, there's the one that you can see. You can see that there's uh, some timestamp options in there. Is this some Uber Elite hacker backdoor? No, it's part of a BitTorrent session. But if you weren't collecting all this other data, you might not be able to tell, all right? OK. Example six, this is probably my favorite because you have to go really far down the investigative road to figure out what's happening. This is an alert for some sort of MSSQL probe response overflow attempt. All right? It's UDP, and I don't know why more intruders aren't using UDP because everyone concentrates on TCP, but UDP is really where it's at, I think. It's, it makes things a lot more difficult. Encrypted UDP. Find me a tool that will rebuild TFTP, by the way. Difficult, all right? That's a good, anyone who's looking for a good open source project, please write me a TFT instruction tool. Cool. Um, so this alert comes in, it says, hey, this is UDP traffic. It's um, a, a site coming into my site. And here's what it is. So it's all binary. I can't really do anything with it. So immediately I start to get a little more worried. When I can't read it, obviously there's, there's something that to, to be uh, looked at here. Well, well, the next thing I did was I said, all right, well, show me all the full content. What do you have? And now I see UDP going back and forth. Previously, the UDP was from somebody's site to mine. Now I see my site going out to them as well. When I see back and forth traffic, UDP, I can't read it. Immediately, you know, I get worried. This is what I do. I get worried. <laughs> this is going to be great. I can't wait for my family to see this on, uh, on video. OK. Well, when you, when you Look for alerts. There's only one alert here. But you notice that there was a lot of UDP. So that's kind of interesting. So there's that one alert. And you'll notice that there's lots of sessions all involving the source IP. So I still haven't decided whether or not this is something I care about. I've got sessions, right? I've got this one alert. But really, what's going on here? You don't want to just query on the source, right? Because the source has only revealed these seven sessions. The next thing I do is I query on my IP within a time period that's associated with this issue. And immediately, I see tons of stuff. Whenever I, s and by the way, part of what we're doing here is trying to teach my investigative methodology. When I see stuff that I can't, I don't recognize, the first thing I do is look for something I do recognize that's nearby. And by, by that, I see a couple things. One is a DNS request right below the arrow. And then at the arrow is a web request. So I immediately go to that web request and I say, hey, web request, what are you? And it turns out this is a get request looking for the latest version of what? Skype. So all this other stuff, this is all probably Skype related. Is this going to give you an alert, the fact that someone did a Skype download? Maybe, maybe not. But the interesting thing about this is, even if it did, the IPs are different, right? The IP that was involved with the UDP is not the same IP that's involved with the Skype download. But based on what I've seen, I have a high probability of thinking this is Skype related. In other words, Skype ends up using a lot of UDP packets on weird ports, that two boxes that you don't have any clue who they are in Russia, but it's probably OK. All right, this is my last example, example seven, one that Mark Sachs is going to beat me up when he tries to jump me as I leave the conference, but he doesn't know I have ninja powers, and I will quickly overcome him. Um, <laughs> Example seven, right? So on, on March 2nd, this, the point of this one I'm going to show you is that sometimes it's better to step away from the computer <coughs> and maybe talk to a person to figure out what's happening. I had to do it via email, but OK. Um, March 2nd, SANS ISC, Internet Storm Center, they, po they post a report saying they are generally seeing SYNAC traffic 
coming from pack, uh, from sources 80, 666, 666, and 443 TCP from this box, compton.amera.ca. I looked at this and I immediately said, I know what this is, right? This is this is this Compton on America box is not the is not a, an intruder here. This guy is the victim. He's getting sin flooded on ports that you'd want to sin flood. Web, IRC, HTTPS, and these are little slides that I presented at SANS in 2000. I wrote about it in '9. They accepted my paper in 2000. Well, here we are, seven years later. We still got people stuck in the 1997 mindset, right? So I said, you know what? Why why don't I just call this guy or email this guy and say, hey, dude, have you been sin flooded recently? So I sent him an email. Actually, I asked Sands to do it. Crickets. You know, they didn't care. So I contact Brad, and I, or I, you know, I found out who this was, and I said, hey, can you tell me what's been going on with you? He says, yeah, I've been getting sin flooded for about three weeks now, um, taking measures. I hope that these guys just give up. So this guy was getting sin flooded. What was happening was ports that were open, he, you know, people were being spoofed. Sin packet goes in, sin act goes out. The sin act goes to the guy who's being spoofed. Mr. Spoofed Man gets this packet and looks at it and says, whoa, sin act from port 80 uh, must be the latest Uber Elite attack. And there's a weird TCP options. I need to report it to SANS. SANS says, woo, woo, you know, send out trucks. Uh, there's some kind of weird attack going on. We need packets. What's going on? And I'm like, excuse me. This is just a sin flood. Don't worry about it. Wrote about it seven years ago. Didn't care. Okay. So the next thing that happens is I said, hey, Brad, you don't happen to have any packet traces, do you? And he says, well, I don't have any of the stuff from when I was getting the sins, but I have this new stuff. And it turns out it was an ACK flood. So he was being ACK flooded as well. Um, and so I said that to Sands. And they're like, well, that doesn't match up with what we saw originally. What's going on? I said, how much clearer does this have to be? Well. The next thing that I get is from this gentleman here, who we haven't met, but he sent it to me. This is botnet command and control traffic showing bots sin flooding the guy who's supposed to be sending out the bad traffic. So this, is, this right here is actual attack traffic against Brad. And I looked at that and I said, how much clearer does it have to be, right? And they're like, well, you know, this TCP options thing is, I that and you know it's nice you sent me botnet traffic showing an actual attack against the person we think is the bad guy but whatever so the next thing I said was Ugh, all right this is really killing me you know what there's a thing called the Museum of Broken Packets that Michael Zalewski hosts and I thought of it after listening to the, the latest SANS threat cast right where they talked about this TCP options follow-up and they posted this packet you know and this bad 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 uh, bites in red those, those must be bad and so I said you know what we may never solve exactly why those bytes were there, but you know, there's this place called the Museum of Broken Packets, and they have all this weird traffic that was collected in the wild. Maybe if you look at that, it'll change your mindset. And so I, I had seen the site of four years ago when it was first put up, and I hadn't been there since, but I started scrolling down, and I almost jumped off my chair when I saw the same byte sequence as Sands was reporting. And it turns out there's a tool called Juno Z, which actually a guy in my blog had made a comment, but I didn't follow up on it until then. This tool generates packets with the same exact broken TCP, TCP options as SANS was seeing. In other words, the SYN packets were going in with the broken TCP options, and the victim was replying with the same broken TCP options. So we have confirmation from the guy who's actually getting attacked. We have botnet traffic showing the guy was being attacked. We have the actual tool that is generating the attack. And what do you think I heard from SANS? <laughs> Crickets. Nothing. Anyway. Oh, they did. Oh, yay. All right. That's good. Was it, was it Mike Poor? You don't remember? Anyway, Mike, Mike would probably have been like, oh, oh. OK. So the conclusion I'd like to leave you with is, um, wow, that's interesting. My Dow Security Enterprise Trust Pyramid. Uh, what I would say is that investigating these events, you, you need to have a trusted high fidelity data. And one of the best ways to do that is to just get a box on the network collecting traffic in a ring buffer. You know, if you want details, it's in my books. I'll, I'll point you to a blog post, wherever the case may be. Just get something that's collecting data that you can investigate. Because if you're stuck with a simple alerting product, and I don't say simple, these things are very complex, obviously, and they do a lot of work. But if you don't have data to investigate, you can end up being very frustrated. Now, if you thought I was going to mention Gartner in the last two minutes that I have, let's talk just briefly about what Gartner said in 2000. 
Gartner said in 2003, and no one ever does these sort of retrospectives about what they predicted, which I love to, to look at. So in 2003, Gartner said, IDSs have failed to provide value relative to its cost. They'll be obsolete by 2005. Didn't happen, right? Um, it, they said that IDS does not add an additional layer of security as promised by vendors, and they've been costly and ineffective. Well, that's probably true. I don't know about the, the not adding a layer of security. There is a certain level of visibility, but that visibility to me is only good when you complement it with something else, like what I talked about. And they thought that the final piece was all that capability would eventually end up in firewalls, which hasn't been the case, but I think everything eventually is going to collapse onto the switch as far as inspection goes, so we may see that. Now, the last thing about Gartner was they said that um, the, problem, the problem with IDSs were these four things, false positives, false negatives, burden on the organization, taxing instant response, inability to monitor at higher rates. I think all of that is bull, right? None of that is solved by a fast firewall. And as two pa parting shots to my beloved vendors, Cisco and ArcSight, this is Cisco Mars. If you're considering buying this thing, please read my blog post. I went insane using this thing. It can be used, but not by itself, right? It, it needs some data. And then finally, ArcSight. Again, ArcSight can be used, but not by itself, in my opinion. The next generation of good security products you're going to see are going to say, here's something interesting that I found. Right click and take you to a network forensic appliance. And then you're going to have some data to investigate. That's botnet uh, DNS that I used in a recent incident to find compromised hosts because I could not do anything else with what I was forced to use. It's 1.51. I'll be happy to take a couple questions. This concludes the formal portion of my talk. Sir, you had a question. Well, I was curious about the Cisco thing. I was surprised you actually got the box to work. Usually when I try to get it to work, I'm usually Ah, the <laughs> comment was surprised that I even got Cisco to work. No, that, I wasn't, I, the only reason I was using Cisco was I was working with a VAR that deployed Cisco. So they brought me in to make it, make it, to use it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sir, yes. For the, the networks that have really high traffic rates, what can you do? If I have two gig the net that's used pretty consistently, I can't record all the packets. Sure. What I would say is you record what you can, and you, you have the capability to record everything for certain things that you care about. In other words, in the event that you say, hey, I think it's maybe compromised, be able to turn on full content for that box. But if recording it all the time is not an option, don't worry about that. Do collect sessions, though. Sessions, you can probably scale up to that, those speeds. <laughs> Right. I mean, you know, Co when it comes to that sampling level, you know, what you, for your tau, what's your zen for sampling? Was what about S flow, net flow sampling? <coughs> my my down moment for that is whatever you can get that's more than what you have now is good. In other words, if you're doing nothing right now, getting a sample is better than nothing. If you can get a perfect representation of sessions, that's even better. But if you can't, something's better than nothing. Yes. Yeah, just a comment on investigative analysis is going to go on the web page. Uh, Google is a good tool as well. It's sure. Great, uh, yeah. The comment. Data. That gentleman's comment was rather than vi visiting directly, use Google Cache to to visit. Any other questions, sir? <laughs> capabilities of logging what? Snort lot, it picks up something that's logging abilities. Or snort lot IPS. Oh, snort line is an IPS. Uh, I have no problem with snort in line as an IPS. The biggest problem with it is you have to come up with your own rule set essentially. You have to make those decisions as to what you want to drop and, and allow. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's fine. I, I don't, I think personally, separate things that block traffic from things that collect traffic. If you have them on the same, you, you put all your back, all your eggs in that one basket, it's a bad idea. <laughs> Any other questions? Sir? SSL. Okay. Oh, thank you for the SSL question. To me, SSL on the inbound is a non-issue because you can architect your way around that. You put in your SSL accelerator, whatever. If you're in some sort of, some sort of uh, situation where the organization simply will not accept terminating that SSL somewhere so that you can inspect behind it, get a new job, because they clearly don't understand the importance of being able to see what's happening. The SSL that I worry about is outbound, because you can't do anything about it, unless you teach the user that when you see, you know, because you could do outbound SSL, intercept it, terminate it, restart it, but now you have to teach all those users to accept this SSL certificate is not, you know. So to me, outbound SSL is a real, real hassle that there's, there's no answer for. Don't users normally accept that 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. the Cowboys don't use is normally accept that anyway. Yeah, trouble. I, I'll take, uh, sorry, I already took a question for you. I want to take one more and then, then we'll call it a day. Yes. Yes. Oh, so the comment was I sort of dismissed the idea of the inbound host makes an outbound web request, it gets a certain response, and I sort of said, oh, I'm not going to worry about this right now. You could architect any type of covert channel you want. It's just a question of do I have the time now to see whether or not this is a problem? If I were to design a covert channel that I wanted to use over web, yeah, I would make it look like the box is not serving up requests anymore. Or, you know, make it look some, like something normal. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Oh, hi, Jason. Hey, nice to meet you. No, is it in Columbia? Yeah. Oh, okay, neat. Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll try that. Hi there. Thanks. Thanks. It's nice having the, guy, the actual guy who sent me traffic in the uh, in the audience. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, man, that, talk about making the point. That was uh, that was pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, sorry. Hey, Rich. Hi there. How are you? Good. Good. Long time no see. Yeah. You know, I'm uh, keeping busy. Where are you at now? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, pretty nice. You saw Higby, he's here. I was going to power strip. Yeah. Is he under there? He, yeah, I saw him uh, just at lunch. So he's, he's nearby. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Hey there. Oh, hi, Jeff. Oh, thank you. What kind of a